everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. I'm very excited to be here and to have the opportunity to explain our project. It's called Tornado VM. And I'm going to start by telling you a little bit of history. So Java, in early days, wasn't famous because of its performance. However, programmers prefer to sacrifice performance at the cost of better programmability and portability. Later on, Java introduced the first just-in-time compiler, and that was a huge jump to achieve high performance. That was around 1997, 1996, I believe. And the main processor at that time were CPUs. However, now, 2019, I think situations have changed a little bit. We have more type of processors in play. We have GPUs, we have FPGAs, we have custom design chips. For example, Google has implemented its own processor for TensorFlow. And most likely, due to the crisis of Moore's law, we're going to find more type of hardware, specialized hardware for specialized tasks in the near future. However, there is not a single virtual machine that can target all of them. And that's where Tornado VM comes in place. So Tornado VM is a plugin to OpenJDK that allows you to run Java programs on heterogeneous systems. And that includes multi-core CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs. Even more, Tornado VM can migrate execution from one device to another at runtime. How cool is that? So um, this is my agenda for today. I'm going to start by setting some background and just setting the terminology just to be all of us on the same page. And then I'm going to jump to the main section. So I'm going to explain you how this is done, how we can compile code, how can we run, and how can we, can we migrate execution at runtime. And then I'm going to show you some performance results we have. Before that, this is my first time in this conference, so I thought it was a good opportunity to present myself. Hello, I'm Juan Fumero. I'm a postdoc now at the University of Manchester in UK. I'm the current technical developer of um, the Tornado VM. And before that, I, I did my PhD at the University of uh, Edinburgh in UK, also working on GPU compilation for Java R and Ruby using Graal and Truffle. So my PhD was in Tornado, it was something different. It was, you might think, like kind of the father of Tornado uh, or predecessor of Tornado. So what we're doing is taking the ideas we implement in that project into Tornado. Before that, I also did uh, an internship at Oracle Labs working on Truffle R implementation for distributed computing. And as you can see, my background is mostly I mean, parallel computing and uh, GPU computing and so on. Right, so let's go to business. Um, why do we want to use heterogeneity, heterogeneous hardware in the first place anyways? So here I show you um, different type of hardware. I show you a CPU, a GPU, and an FPGA. And my purpose is to show you some numbers. So if you get a CPU, Ice Lake, um, for example, you get up to eight cores. You can have also AVX instructions. And if you use the GPU that is integrated inside the CPU, that CPU, you can get up to one teraflop of performance. However, let's look at the GPU. That's a Pascal microarchitecture. It's two generations old from NVIDIA. And instead of having eight cores, you can have physical 3,500 cores. Um, that gives you a performance of up to 10 teraflops, so 10 times faster, like, theoretically, than a CPU. And similar situation applies for FPGAs. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about a lot about GPUs and FPGAs. So just, I believe many of you know this already, but just to set up the terminology, what is an FPGA? FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. Basically, it's a piece of hardware that you can do whatever you want after manufacturing. So the FPGA has inside uh, logic slides like composed of loops, flip-flops, uh, programmable VRAMs, and DSP blocks. And basically, you prototype your circuits. So it has been uh, traditionally used for uh, digital pro prototyping digital circuits. However, researchers and industry realize that this type of hardware can be used for acceleration. Actually, many people use for Bitcoin, for example. Um, so you can see this as, as a wiring your algorithms into physical hardware. So, spoiler alert, Tornado can target FPGAs, which means that we can wire the Java methods into physical hardware. 
Okay, so let's jump to the GPU. Uh, I, may, I, I think many of you know this already. It's more familiar than FPGAs, at least. So F GPUs stand for graphics processing units, mainly used for rendering and graphics processing. However, in the pipeline of computation to do the graphics, uh, some stages in that pipeline can be used for um, uh, general purpose computation. And that's where CUDA and OpenCL, these, these languages come from. My point here is that with CUDA and OpenCL, so the programmers to use these devices need to know the programming model first. But second, and to me it's more important, they need to know architectural details. This is a, this is, you need to have, you have to know this. And this might be a killer feature or a handicap for many potential users. For example, uh, L1 cast on GPUs are not uh, coherent, which means that if you have data in there, you have to add manual barriers. The users also need to know how threads are organized inside the GPU, and so on and so forth. So don't take this as a tutorial for GPU. My key message here is the users need to know, apart from the programming model, architecture details, okay? Right, so why do we want to use heterogeneous systems anyways? Here I'll show you with Tornado, execution with Tornado. So it's a application called DFT. X actually shows input data, Y actually shows speed up against hotspot. And I show Tornado running on multi-core i7, an integrated graphics by Intel, so Intel HD, an FPGA by Nalatech, and an NVIDIA Quattro GPU. And as you can see, this system has, I think, eight cores multi-threading, so you can get thousands of speedups, and this is in Tornado, right? So uh, that's a reason why we want to use these systems. Um, right, so I talk about hardware, now I'm gonna switch to the programming language perspective. How do we use them? So if you want to use the FPGA, traditionally you use RTL or VHDL, VHDL. Those languages, basically you program on the logic gate. I want these gates, wire these gates to this system, and so on and so forth. More recently, you can use OpenCL for FPGAs. If you want to use a GPU, you can use, for example, CUDA, OpenCL. You can also use external libraries, but they, this library internally will make use of, most likely, CUDA and OpenCL. By the way, these are a few examples, okay? There are many programming languages that you can fit here. But all of these languages can be used for programming uh, CPUs. However, programmers tend to use higher level abstractions. Um, many potential users, they want to use Python, R, Ruby, JavaScript, Java. Uh, they are mainly, so for example, TensorFlow has an API for Python, right? And how do you program those devices for, uh, from, from high level languages? Well, let's get Java. If you get Java and you want to use the GPU, for example, now you have two options. You can use a grapper, who basically the GPU model in C is exposed to the Java part, which means that the user, apart from the Java programming model, needs to know architectural details. It needs to add barriers, needs to know how threads are organized, and so on. So write once, run everywhere. <laughs> or, in my opinion, if you get an untyped language, or dynamically typed language, depending on your view, like JavaScript, Ruby, R, these type of languages, the situation is a bit worse because OpenCL is a strongly typed and you're on 4C type system from high level language. You don't have the, the notion of de-optimizations and so on. By the way, I'm not saying this is bad, not at all. I'm saying that for many users should be an alternative, okay? Uh, what these high level languages have in common is they're executing on top of a virtual machine. But there is, there is no such a thing for targeting a heterogeneous system. And that's what we propose. So Tornado VM, as I said before, it's a plugin to OpenJDK to run, for now, Java programs on GPUs, uh, FPGAs, and so on. For now, we target Java, but in the future, we might target other type of languages. In, ha in fact, we have prototype for that. <clears throat> right, so let's jump to the main section, um, Tornado VM. And I'm gonna start by showing you a demo first. Um, this is a... This demo is, is Kinect Fusion, so it's a Kinect, Microsoft Kinect camera. Basically, the goal of this application is to render in real time the whole room, okay? Real time means at least 30 frames per second. And uh, this is open source, you can download, you can play with it. The whole code is 
few written in Java. It's around 7K lines of Java code. And I'm gonna show you three different setups. So I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna jump here. I record a video just in case. Um, okay. Um, first, I'm gonna run basic Java. So it's gonna be hotspot, okay? Um, I'm gonna start. So on the left-hand side, you're gonna see the input with four different setups, like death camera, light scene, so options in the Kinect. The right-hand side, you're gonna see the output. And believe me, it's running. It's around one frame per second. It's extremely slow, okay? So what I'm gonna, I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna stop the application. Yeah, it doesn't render almost anything. So hopefully you can notice something, but. So I'm gonna stop the application, I'm gonna reset and I'm gonna enable Tornado. So the whole program is the same thing, it's just written in Java, but I enable Tornado. And first I'm gonna run on the multi-core system. So hopefully we can see something different now, a little faster, a little faster. Yeah, I don't know if you can notice, but it seems to be faster. So in actual case, actually it's running around four frames per second on a four-core machine. Not that bad. So what I do now, I'm gonna do stop, reset, and then go to the GPU. Hopefully we can see something different. And now we can see in a few seconds how we can render the whole room. So the whole application is pure Java, okay? We are jitting the code from bytecode to OpenCL. I will explain in the details now. In fact, we can render the whole room in a few seconds. We can achieve, so this uh, was, is this in, in my laptop, so it's nothing fancy, uh, in a 1050, and we can get up to 80, 70 to 80 frames per second. So more than the quality of service. Right, so let's go into, into the details of Tornado now that I have shown you the candy. Right, so Tornado, um, we have a layer architecture and a microkernel architecture. So on the top level, you see the API. So we expose an API to the user, okay? What we do is we exploit parallelism. We don't detect parallelism. So we need a way to identify which method you want to run on a heterogeneous system. So the way we do this is we, we, do, we expose what we call task-based parallelism, and each task is a reference to an existing Java method. That's what we call a task. You can create a group of tasks, that's what we call task schedule, and we can compile all of these tasks on the same compilation unit and run on one device. Then we have our runtime that optimizes data transfer between those tasks plus we do our own bytecode generation. So we have, on top of Java, we have our own bytecodes. Obviously, we need an interpreter, bytecode interpreter to run those bytecodes, and the interpreter eventually will get a JIT compiler, for now we just Graal, we extend Graal, to a, with a new backend from Java bytecode to OpenCL. So this is a very high level overview, now I'm gonna go into the details of this. I'm gonna start with API, I'm gonna start with an example. You have a class compute, and you have a method, matrix multiplication, and what you write there is the sequential application, okay? We expose a few types, for example, matrix 2D, but you can use primitives. Uh, and what is inside the method is legal Java code, okay? We don't support a full Java, we support a subset of Java, but basically, you can write any Java code in here. And there's nothing special, it's a typical matrix multiplication, and the th first thing the user needs to do is to annotate the code with add parallel. Um, this annotation is a hint for the compiler. So what I want to say is we don't force parallelism. We take that annotation as a hint, which means that if we don't even detect that the loop is completely parallel, we just bail out and execute the sequential. So it's relaxed parallel semantics, okay? Right, once the user identifies the loops, it, will, it, it has to create a task schedule. So remember, a task schedule is an object that creates a group of tasks. Each task is a reference to an existing Java method. So on the bottom, you can see create an object called task schedule. It passes a name, a random name. It's just, if you want to change the device, you refer to that name at runtime. And then create task dot task dot task dot task. How many tasks as you want? In this case, we only have one. We call, okay, compute the task T0, whatever name you want, and then point to the class compute method MXM, and then you pass the parameters as a normal invocation call, right? And then you need to define which variable you need to copy back to the host site. In this case, it's the matrix C, we expect the output there, and then you call execute. 
as easy as that. To run Tornado, you just type Tornado and your class, and your main class, and that's all. In fact, Tornado is just a grabber, it's just an alias. But Java plus all the ugly you know, command, you know, parameters to enable Tornado, but it's just normal Java with JVNCI. Okay, let me show you another example, map reduce computation. Uh, that I know that other alternatives like Aparapi, they have problems to express map reduce. So how do we do this? We have a class compute. You can't have any, any class name, by the way. Uh, you have two methods, map and reduce. And then on the bottom, we create a task scheduler as before. And then we can say, create two tasks. The first one is map. The second is reduce. And you pass the proper references to each method. One of, one of the things I want to point out, we have a call called streaming and then stream out. This, in my opinion, is real stream computing. Uh, an alternative is stream API in Java 8, which is not real streams. In fact, as soon as you consume the stream, you cannot reuse it. Okay? You have to create a new stream. In our case, we define the computation and the channel is open with new data coming out, in and out. Right? And you can see plenty of examples. Uh, um, Tornado is open source, so you can have a look at We have many, many cases in there. Right. So let's go to something more interesting, hopefully. Um, how do we compile this? How do we execute this? Well, first of all, the user annotates the code and then compile with normal Java. There is no modification in there. Then we plug in Tornado, basically JDK with this extension for Tornado and we start running the application. So the first thing we do is data flow analyzer is part of the runtime, and the runtime will orchestrate the execution on the target device. For the compilation, we extend Graal. Graal internally has, well, this is technical details, but has different tiers of compilation, have the high level IR, which may, uh, uh, architecture independent optimizations, mid IR with memory optimizations, and low IR with architecture dependent optimizations. So what we do is we have the Graal IR plus our own nodes inserted in the, in the IR. Basically, this allow us to have the typical Graal compilation or JVN compilation in, combina in combination with our own optimizations. And I believe this is a key difference with all the works. For example, Aparapi is alternative. They translate directly from bytecodes to OpenCL with any optimization uh, behind. In our case, we can say, oh, Graal allow us to do parse and skip analysis, uh, loop and rolling, uh, constant propagation, this kind of stuff. Plus, we can pass our own. We say, oh, this loop is parallel. So remove the loop, well, actually, replace the loop node and introduce the global ID, which is the loop indexing with OpenCL, for example. And this kind of stuff. And at the end, we have a, another source is an open CLC code, which means that we need another compiler after that to compile this to binary. If we're using NVIDIA GPU, we invoke the NVIDIA driver, and we, get, we will get the PTX back. If we are using an FPGA from Intel, we invoke the Intel compiler, and we will get the bit stream, so basically the configuration file for the FPGA. Right. Another key thing we do is compiler specializations. And that means that the code we generate for CPUs is different than the code we generate for GPUs and FPGAs. The reason is OpenCL, the code is portable, but performance is not portable at all. So one example is, okay, you have your um, method, and then we, do, we, create the, we invoke to, to, to build a Graal IR, and then we say, oh, you're targeting GPUs. So specialize the IR to use a fine-grained parallelism which means that each thread is gonna compute its own data item. Um, I saw an example in Java, but actually all the transformations happen directly in the Graal IR or Tornado IR. If we're using the CPU, we say, okay, specialize the IR to use coarse grain parallelism, basically. So each thread is gonna compute a range of data items. Another example of a specialization is for FPGAs, and <laughs> in this case, is yeah, we need to do it because otherwise, without any specialization, we don't get any speed up at all, at all. In fact, we get the slowdowns for many of the applications. So how do we do that? Well, I show you an example. We have two parallel loops on the, on the left. We have an IR that represents 
part of the, this computation. And if you are familiar with the Gral IR, you will recognize many of these nodes. Some of the nodes are from Tornado. For example, get global ID is Tornado, global size is Tornado. And for the FGA, we need to set up the configuration, the thread configuration directly in the source, which means execute this in 64 threads by 64, okay? So that's a, a, a scheduling attributes. We need to define also the loop and rolling factor. And this is, uh, th we need to do this because we can save circuits on the FGA, right? And that gives us a better speed up. Okay, so by doing these transformations, if we don't do anything, we get, for example, for DFT, we can get up to 5x performance on a eight core machine. It's not that impressive. We get some performance, but it's not that impressive. If we enable these optimizations, we go up to 240x, which, hey, now start, we start talking now, right? Okay, cool. So I'm gonna keep this one. So I'm gonna jump to something more interesting, hopefully. And I'm gonna talk about how we can configure a runtime, how can migrate tasks between devices. So Tornado can be seen as a VM in a VM. Why? Because we have our own bytecode interpreter, we manage execution, we manage compilation, we manage memory, we know we handle byte buffers and so on, and we can perform task migration. So the workflow is as follows. So if you run Tornado, but you don't have any task schedules inside, you start with OpenJDK, you run in interpreter modes. If the code gets hot, you get whatever compiler is underneath, C1, C2, Graal, and you get the CPU code. However, if you run Tornado and you have the task schedule, you're gonna reach the, the uh, Tornado compiler. We do a data flow analyzer, an optimizer, and then we generate bytecodes. So we have our own bytecode interpreter. Uh, with, with this strategy, we can easily migrate execution between devices. I know this is very abstract, this is just an overview, and I'm gonna go do now is I'm gonna go into details to how this works. Okay, so I'm gonna go through an example. Uh, it's the same I showed you at the very beginning, the MapReduce computation. So just to recall, um, we have a task schedule, we have two tasks, map and reduce, and we, for each task, we pass input, output, input, output. But for the first task, the input is the real input. The output, yeah, it's the output from the first task, but I don't need it back on the host. It's a temporal variable that can keep, can stay on the device. In that way, I save data transfers. I haven't mentioned yet, so the, why is important to save data transfers? So in these systems, memory are, uh, memory is separated, so the, the GPU has its own memory that I need to pre-allocate and perform data transfer between devices. And that's a very expensive operation. So if I can save some data transfer, I can get a speed up overall. So then we build a data flow graph, and this is on the right. For the input, we say, ah, this is a copy in, you need to copy the content, well, allocate and copy the content to the target device. And then you need to allocate the space for the output. But the output, I don't need it back. So you compute the first one, you compute the second, and then you get the output. So what we do is, okay, this graph is already optimized, let's generate bytecodes. So all group of tasks are enclosed in two, in two bytecodes, begin and end. And you, we pass an identifier which tells us the device in which could potentially run on. But it doesn't matter, we can change the device at runtime. But just, if the user doesn't specify anything, that's the device we're gonna use. And then we start traversing the graph. It's a very simple process. For the first one, we say, we need to copy in this variable, and this bytecode will allocate the space, a lock on the target device, the buffer allocation on the GPU or the FGA, and we perform the data transfer. For the second, we just alloc, okay? And then we say, ah, many of the bytecodes in Tornado are non-blocking, which means that before running, I need to guarantee this is finished, so I add a barrier and then I can launch the task. And this case is telling me, now you're gonna run the task called map, which is a method uh, I showed you previously. And the first time we run this bytecode, we say, is this task already compiled? No, so we get, okay, Graal, give me the Graal IR, I'm gonna start specializing the code, I'm gonna compile the code, I'm gonna run it. Second time we encounter the same task, we just get it from the code cache. And then similar process for the other task. 
We just add a dependency, to allo we allocate the output, we launch the reduction, and then we do the final copy, blocking copy, just to synchronize with the host variable. Right, so these bytecodes are, in my opinion, a very, very, very simple way to orchestrate the runtime. This bytecode runs on the host. We never intended to offload those bytecodes to the target device. So it runs, it's just pure runtime orchestra orchestration. What this allows us to do is more complex stuff. For example, imagine this scenario, this is scenario. I want to compute 16 gigabytes of data on a GPU that only has one gigabyte. How do we do that? Well, we expose uh, uh, a call in the API called batch. Uh, and I say, well, I'm using three arrays. Uh, I, I'm, I'm using three arrays. I say three megabytes, so 900 megabytes. They fit in one gigabyte. I can run this on the GPU. What happening underneath is I batch, I execute in batches, right? So copy in, copy, uh, copy in, execution, copy out, first batch, and so on and so forth. So by just changing the offset in, the, in our runtime, we can do these kind of things. So basically, minimal changes and the runtime is practically the same thing. Right, so let's jump to something even more exciting, at least for me, and it's the following. Since we can compile for many devices, we can specialize the code for many type of devices, let's do all of them in parallel. So what we do is, let's run one thread, the sequential one, as the, the input application as usual, nothing changes there, just to make sure that we make progress on the execution and let's spawn a set of threads that they are gonna run, compile and run on that device. And then we have a decision logic to eventually switch to one of those devices. So what's actually happening in each thread is they have an instance of the Tornado VM, of the VM, right? And they will run those bytecodes. And then we will have the decision logic that will tell us, hey, I know you're running on the sequential thread, but if you switch to the GPU, you're gonna get much better performance. Now you might think, okay, how is the decision logic made? Okay, we have what we call policies. And uh, we have three for now. Uh, we have end-to-end -end policy, peak performance policy, and latency. What's the difference? End-to-end -end will encounter, in the decision logic, will encounter JIT compilation and execution. Copy in, execution, copy out. Peak performance, it will not encounter JIT compilation, plus it will do a warm-up phase, okay? These two policies, end-to-end -end and peak performance, we wait for all threads to finish in order to make a decision. Uh, this we, could be quite slow, but it will guarantee that you switch to the, to the fastest one. The latency, on the other hand, uh, it will just, the first thread to finish, I'm gonna jump over it and kill the rest. That will be more suitable for you know, server applications. So I believe this is interesting because uh, we could do something more clever like, okay, give me the device, switch to the device that consumes less energy. Or given these energy constraints, give me the device, switch to the device that give me the best performance, okay? And I want to push to this community something um, that we believe is interesting. So right now, if you don't load OpenJDK, you just start running an interpreted bytecode, and then you will reach whatever compiler is underneath, a few tiers of compilation, C1, C2, but as soon as you reach the maximum compilers, assuming C2 or GRAL, there is nothing after that. You cannot get faster, okay? However, if we plug in the dynamic reconfiguration, we might get something faster after all. And it, actually, we've seen, I, I will show you in our experimental evaluation, we can switch from code that has been compiled from hotspot to switch to a multi-core configuration and then switch again to a GPU. Why is that switching? Because if you have an expression, okay, a computation you want to do, and your data is increasing, maybe you want to consider it to switch to the device as well. Because the granularity is changing. Okay, so I have shown you some of the properties of Tornado. Um, I'm gonna compare against uh, or discuss against related work. I think many of you have heard about these projects, Sumatra, Aparapi, or IBM GPU. 
um, all of them actually only focus on GPUs. Meanwhile, Tornado focus, it doesn't matter. It, it's not only focused on GPU itself, right? Uh, so also, any of them, they, so for example, Sumatra, you, all lo you all flow the code to the GPU, but you don't know if the GPU is gonna be faster, actually. In Tornado, we only switch if, go, if we go faster. One of the things I want to be very clear is we don't want to replace it too. We don't want to say, no, no, everything's gonna be to the GPU, everything's gonna be to the FPGA, no. Only go to the target device if it makes sense to use it. GPUs are very good at exploiting data parallel applications. Meanwhile, FPGAs are very good to exploit parallel or parallelism-based applications, right? So if it's just to add a complementary execution mode where you can run faster. Um, also, uh, also while, while preparing this talk, um, I realized that there is a pending, is a uh, pending uh, Java enhancement proposal for Sumatra. And we realized that many things we already do that. So, well, the first one is obvious. No syntactical changes to Java. Well, we have our own, our own API, so this one is not, um, is not that clear. Then, obviously, we have a detection, auto detection of the software stack. We have, I hope I convince you that we have an heuristic to decide where to switch. It, it's because it gives us better performance. Uh, we have in, in performance improvement, well, you have to believe it, I'm gonna show you now in experiment evaluation. And uh, then we also have some pending things, like if we get an exception for now, it, we will crash. But it will, it's easy to just be the opt and then run the sequential application, that's, that's very easy to support. And then we have others, like uh, will not expose any additional security risks. Well, I'm not an expert in security, but what I can tell, of course, GPUs has, uh, has security issues. And we expose the same issues that GPUs or FPJ have. However, in Tornado, I see this as an opportunity. Why? Because we are under the VM. So the VM can control many things for you. I'm not saying that this will solve all security issues, but for sure, many of them. And then, for example, in offloads, also, the, or the possibility of offloading code to other, other languages like R, Ruby, and so on. So for now, Tornado does not support that, but the prototypes I did in my PhD, we did it. So we know the path how to achieve that. Apart from that, we have additional features that we believe are very interesting. Like, as I say, we don't focus on one target device, like GPU computing is the future. No, no, no. We target many, and we can select, depending on the application, the best one. We also perform task migration, and we specialize the code. And then we have others, like we also can accelerate uh, existing, existing libraries. So in fact, we can call, uh, so in your Java method you want to compile or to run on the target device, you can have uh, calls to native code. In that case, we solve it just using intrinsics, or accelerate external libraries as soon as we can support the features that the external libraries have. And then we can do other things that I know is difficult thing for, uh, for example, upper API or, or IBM, uh, like explo automatically exploiting tier level of, uh, of the target device. So GPUs has different level of memory that you can play with. They have constant memory, global memory, local memory, and private memory and you can program all of them to maximize performance. So the way Aparapi, for example, solve this is include API calls to the users. Right? We can do this automatically in the IR. We're working on that, actually. Okay, cool. What about performance? So, um, I'm gonna show you now the dynamic reconfiguration in action. Remember that dynamic reconfiguration is the ability of Tornado to dynamically switch to the target device. So here I show you two benchmarks, DFT on the top and body on the bottom with two different policies, end-to-end -end and peak performance. X axis shows input data, input size, Y axis shows speed up against hotspot. The line shows the ability to tornado, of Tornado to dynamically switch. And the dots or, or squares shows I just select this device, no static change, no dynamic changes, okay? 
So, for example, in the case of DFT end-to-end, um, I show that first, if the, da if the input data is very small, Tornado DM will tell me, don't go to the GPU, just stay here, okay? The data is too small, it doesn't make sense to switch. As soon as the data increases, uh, we see that either we can use a multi-core system or the GPU, and Tornado will do that automatically for us. If we see the peak performance DFT, so both, uh, top right, we see that we start directly on multi-core and then we switch to the GPU. More, interesting, more interestingly is, imagine we don't have the GPU, which is the normal setup in servers right now. We have a multi-core system plus a FPG attached. We will start running a multi-core and then as soon as the data increases, like uh, pretty much, we will, start, we will switch to the FPGA. And that's very interesting. Right, so we can run on many devices. We, here I show you performance on multi-core system, 32 cores, NVIDIA GPU, uh, 12 cores CPU, integrated graphics, and MMD GPU. In this case, it's just a static decision. And for some applications, like Scopy or SaxPy, we don't show in speed, that does make total sense. There are too much data to copy to the device and there is almost nothing to compute. So for those cases, don't go to the GPU or FPGA. However, for others like Monte Carlo, matrix multiplication, DFT, we get very good speed ups. Right. right, so of course we have limitations. I'm gonna talk about a few of them. Uh, we don't support objects, well, not really. We support cert some type of objects. The objects we know they lay out. Uh, but we cannot support inheritance, this kind of stuff. Um, we don't support recursion, for example. The, the thing is, in OpenCL, you cannot express recursion. Uh, or dynamic memory allocation. However, I have to say that, in my opinion, use the accelerator when it makes sense to use it. We can add support for these features on the target device, on the GPU or the FGA, but the complexity of the generated code to support those features are gonna slow down the execution. So it's a trade-off. And because this, we have this ability, if the feature doesn't match exactly what you want to accelerate, just stay with hotspot. They, they do a very good job, right? Uh, then for exceptions, we don't support it, but we are planning to support exceptions in the future. Uh, future world, there are plenty of things to do here. Uh, for example, exploit full capability of the GPUs, FPGAs. I show you one of those, for example, exploit tier of uh, memory on the target device. Include energy policies. Uh, we believe that's very interesting. Or, for example, include multi-device support. What, what does it mean? So, remember that we can create a group of tasks, and this group of tasks are gonna run on one device. What we want to do in future work is Split, split this group of tasks into multiple devices. Like imagine you have two, three, four GPUs, right? And we're working on also to support more skeletons, like stencil, scan, filters, this kind of stuff. Ideally, we want to do it automatically in the yard. We're pushing for that, but it's a hard problem. Right, so how this is being used right now? Well, Tornado is part of a, a project, European project called E2 Data, and these are all the partners. And the goal of the European project is to provide end-to-end -end solutions that fully exploit heterogeneous hardware for distributed systems. Uh, basically, we have Flink inside. Uh, you know, you know Apache Flink, or Spark. So we want to execute the typical MapReduce computation in a distributed setup and in the final node, use heterogeneous systems. So the component, the VM, is the tornado itself, and the rest of the partners will provide the logic. In fact, some companies like Exus in London or Neurocom in Luxembourg, they're using Tornado for accelerating machine learning, uh, natural language processing, this kind of stuff. And uh, well, this is our overall picture of the a2 data project, the European project, so basically you have a distributed scenario, each square represents a compute node, and in the final node, you will have Tornado that can run on the target device. Um, so I, I will need another talk to explain the details of this project, but stay tuned or ask me later if you want to. Right, so just to sum up, um, Tornado 
First of all, Tornin is available online, GitHub. We have also uh, Docker images for NVIDIA GPUs and Intel integrated graphics. So if you don't want to install anything, I understand because you need to deal with the drivers and so on. So you just get the Docker image and run it. Right? In fact, feel free to ask me later, I can run the uh, Docker images in my laptop. Um, of course, I, know I didn't build this by my own. Uh, we have a team, we're growing, uh, mostly composed by PhD students, master's students, but we have a bunch of academic staff and research staff. And we are looking for collaborations um, and feedback as well. So uh, we believe that this is useful for the Java ecosystem. And you are the expert, so uh, we are happy to hear your, your opinion about this. As a takeaway, just to finalize, I show you Tornado VM as a plugin to OpenJDK to run Java on heterogeneous systems. I show you the dynamic reconfiguration. We can, with the dynamic reconfiguration, we can, how can we get tasks at runtime between one device and another? In fact, we can, be see, we can see this as a new tier of compilation for heterogeneous devices. And I have shown you uh, promising speed ups, obviously the benchmark I'll show you, but we believe that this is very useful for many users. And with that, I conclude my presentation, and yeah, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you very much for your attention.